Amen. Well, thanks so much, uh, Charles and the team. Hey, if you've got any preschoolers, uh, follow Jack. <laughs> They're um, heading out the side there. If you want to go out there, I know Nio's out there with some of the kids, I think. So you're welcome to go and use, the, um, use that area with them. Well, James um, prayed earlier about uh, our family being away uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Well, we're heading up to the Bay of Plenty. Actually, I'm heading up on Friday, and then um, Natalie and Daniel are coming up a couple of days later. I'm going to be at Focus Bible Church. Um, you may not have heard of the name of that church. I think they changed their name, but it's where Dennis and Alvera Tomaselli uh, fellowship. Many of you know them. They were here in the Hawke's Bay for many years. So they've asked me to come up and uh, teach next Sunday morning and do some things with their men on the Saturday. And then the following weekend, we'll be heading over to Rotorua to Fenton Park Bible Church where Tony Nunez and Chantal are. Many of you know them as well. They're from Hawke's Bay and so have the opportunity to teach there on a Sunday morning and then do some things with their guys as well on the Saturday. So, and in between, it's school holidays and it's Daniel's birthday as well. So we're going to have a bit of a downtime and a bit of fun up in, uh, in the Bay of Plenty. So pray for, uh, pray for that opportunity, that ministry opportunity that we have up there. And uh, we'll be praying for you and uh, looking forward to catching up when we get back. Well, as you know, we've been going through the, the book of Daniel over the last recent weeks, but this morning I decided to take a little detour, and I want to drop into the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 4. So if you've got your Bibles, um, open up to that chapter. A number of years ago, we looked at this chapter, but there's so many great truths in it that I just want to kind of remind us of those things this morning as we open it up. And as we've been going through the book of Daniel, we've, we've noticed that uh, Daniel and the book of Revelation, they complement each other anyway. There's a, a number of similar themes. They speak of some of the same events. Both of them contain prophecies about future events. And if you remember, if you were here last Sunday, we were in Daniel chapter 7, and, and Daniel was having this vision. And he saw in his vision a future scene in heaven where God was exercising his judgment and his justice, and he was actually bringing judgment upon the Antichrist who had been battling and blaspheming God. Well, this morning, I want to take us back to heaven again to another scene, this time not a judgment scene, but more a scene of worship in heaven. It's that time when the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, the Apostle John, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, he was having a vision. And just like Daniel's vision, God is showing John in the book of Revelation lots of events in the future that are yet to happen. I mean, Revelation is a great book. I, I enjoy reading through Revelation because it tells us about the future. It tells us about events that are going to happen. You know, we don't need to go and visit a fortune teller or gaze into the stars or get your palms read or anything like that. We don't need to guess what's going to happen in the future. We can go to the Bible. And the Bible has some clear details about what the future holds. You can read in the book of Daniel as we have. You can read in other prophets. And you can read in the book of Revelation the things that are going to be revealed in the future. And, you know, some people don't really like the book of Revelation. They get a little bit intimidated by it. But it's actually the only book in the Bible that says if you read the whole thing that you will be blessed. And so if you haven't really had a chance to read through Revelation, I would encourage you to read it. It's a, a really encouraging book. In fact, the book of Revelation was primarily written, first of all, to encourage churches, seven churches. That's why it was originally written. And just like the book of Daniel, Revelation presents a message of hope. It presents a message of victory for God's people. And the bottom line of the book of Revelation is simply this, and that is God wins. God wins. God is victorious. Satan loses. The Antichrist is defeated. In fact, all of God's enemies, all the kings and the rulers and the kingdoms and the nations that have ever existed who are enemies of God, they're all taken down and they will come under his eternal judgment. But as we've seen already in the book of Daniel, Jesus Christ will reign supreme as the King of kings and the Lord of lords forever and forever, and no one or nothing is able to tip him off his throne. And so the book of Revelation, it's a, a victorious message for Christians. It brings hope, it brings joy, it gives enthusiasm, it's a huge motivation for us and even to live a godly life. And by the way, doctrine about the future, when we look at events that are going to take place in the future, 
they should have an impact in our lives in the present. They should have a, a moral impact on our lives. And as you look at future events, they should cause us to live more holy lives and righteous lives and godly lives in the present. And so the book of Revelation is a wonderful book to, to look at. And by the way, I'm fully aware too that in Christian circles, when, you, when you're looking at the book of Revelation, there's, there's a, a few differences in how people understand how the future will play out. But whatever view people hold, we know that ultimately God wins, and that's the key thing to remember. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, it doesn't matter if you are a, a premillennialist or an amillennialist or a postmillennialist or a covenantalist or a dispensationalist, or whether you believe in a pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib rapture, even if you don't even know what those things are, or if you don't know what eschatology is, or you don't really know what view you believe, it really doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, God wins. And Jesus Christ will reign supreme forever and forever. And we, His people, will be able to worship Him and serve Him unhindered forever and forever. And by the way, if you're wondering who are we as a church, what do we believe? We hold to what we would say a premillennial position, a pre-tribulation view. That is the, the teaching that Jesus will return to rapture the church before the tribulation. And then after the tribulation, Jesus will come again. He will set up his kingdom, his millennial kingdom for a thousand years on earth. And during that time, even in the future, God is going to be unveiling and fulfilling his promises that he made to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. And come again next Sunday back here because Peter Clark is going to be teaching and he's going to be talking some more about these great doctrines. In particular, he's going to be talking about uh, Christ coming back again and the rapture and, and everything that Scripture says about that. Well, Re Revelation, as I've said, is a huge encouragement because we know what's going to happen even before it takes place. Now, many of you know that I am a keen supporter of the Liverpool football team. If I was more godly, like Alan, I'd support rugby, but uh, I, I enjoy soccer, as you know. And it's a little bit of a pain supporting them, because most of their games are played in England, obviously, in the afternoon on Saturday, which is like early hours of the morning here in New Zealand, so it's pretty hard to sit down and watch those games live. But sometimes I might um, watch the game a little bit later on. And just as I'm sitting down to watch the game, I might get this like unexpected notification on my phone or on my computer, which gives away the final score. And you know what that's like, right? It can be a little bit frustrating if you're sitting down to watch the game, you don't know the score, and then all of a sudden the score pops up on the screen, and, and it's a, a bit disappointing. Now, if that happens, it can be one of two things. It can be a good thing, because if Liverpool lost, which doesn't happen very often, if they did lose... I don't have to waste any time watching it, but if they win, or if I find out they, they won the game, then I can watch it without having to go through all the highs and the lows and the pain and the agony and the stress associated with watching sport. Now, I know you ladies have no idea what I'm talking about at that moment, but you guys, you know what I'm saying, right? But the book of Revelation functions in exactly the same way as that. We know the end result before the action has even played out. Therefore, as Christians, we don't need to get stressed out about life and what's going on. We can, as it were, sit back and relax and know that our sovereign God, our Lord and our Master, has got everything under control. Everything. We are on the winning team, and the result isn't going to change. And so that ought to generate joy and excitement and worship in our souls as we think about the future. I mean, Christianity really is the only story where we can legitimately say we all live happily ever after. That's what Revelation tells us. Well, here in Revelation chapter 4, as well as chapter 5, actually, we are transported into the throne room of heaven. Look at your Bibles there in the very first verse. It says, after this, the Apostle John says this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. You know, John, I'm sure, at this time in his life, must have been pinching himself because he's already 
had a vision of the exalted Jesus Christ in chapter 1 of Revelation. And now, here in chapter 4, he gets this glimpse of heaven. And so we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning in heaven, seeing what John saw in this vision. Let me read through the passage and set it in our minds. It won't be on the screen, so you'll have to follow if you've got your own Bible there. Revelation chapter 4 says this, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, and the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Well, before we get lost in the detail of this vision of this chapter, I want to make sure that you don't miss the main point of this chapter. Don't want to miss the central focus of this chapter, and that is the throne of God. As we read through those verses 11 times, it refers to the throne. And so our attention as we read through that chapter ought to be on the throne. Everything and everyone in heaven are associated or encircled around this throne. Not because the throne in and of itself is the most significant thing, but as we will see, the one who is sitting on the throne is the most significant. And then if we were to keep reading in chapter 5, we would find out that the one sitting on the throne is holding a scroll, and written on that scroll is the detailed account of what is going to happen in the future. But for now, look at at chapter 4, and certainly there in verse 1, John sees this open door that is leading into heaven, and he hears a voice. This is the voice of Jesus. It's the same voice that John actually heard back in chapter 1 when he had the vision of the exalted Christ. It's a voice that sounds like a trumpet because it's authoritative, because it's commanding, and probably because it's loud. And Jesus says to John, he says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And so Jesus is just about to unfold to John all of the key future events that are going to take place. And he's going to show him all of those things, and that's what the rest of the book of Revelation is all about. He's going to show him scenes in regard to the tribulation and the scene of Jesus' second coming again to earth and the millennial kingdom, and and finally right even into the eternal state when there will be the new heavens and the new earth right at the end of the book of Revelation. But the best way for us to navigate our way through this chapter is just to see everything in regard to the throne, how everything relates to the throne. And verse 2 says there, the throne was standing in heaven. This is a throne that can't be moved. It's a permanent fixture, and it stands as the center of attention in heaven. And therefore, it ought to be the center of attention even in 
our own lives this morning. So we'll look at a number of phrases that relate to the, to the throne. The first one you can see on the screen there is what we might say, on the throne. On the throne. In verse 2, we are introduced to the one sitting on the throne. John doesn't name him, but we know who this is, don't we? Over in Revelation 7, verse 10, it says there, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. We read Isaiah this morning where Isaiah said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted. It's the same scene in heaven. Psalm 47, verse 8 says, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. And then even last time, remember in the book of Daniel in chapter 7, we Daniel had his vision of God on the throne, and in and, and that verse that we looked at last week, Daniel said, I kept looking until thrones were set up, and then he says, and the Ancient of Days, talking about God, took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne, he says, was ablaze with flames. Ezekiel had a similar vision in Ezekiel chapter 1 of the throne of God. And verse 3 here tells us that this one sitting on the throne has an appearance like jasper stone or, and also like carnelian. Um, jasper stone of the first century is probably, they believe, a little bit different to the jasper stone that we may see today. In Revelation 21 verse 11, it describes jasper stone as a crystal clear type of stone, which would probably be more like a diamond as we might think of it today. Carnelian is much like a ruby, which is red in appearance. And so John is having this vision of God on his throne. And put yourself in John's shoes. He's trying to describe God and what he's seeing. I mean, the question is, how do you describe God? How do you explain God? And I think the answer to that is with great difficulty. Remember, God is spirit. But John here is trying to explain the unexplainable. You could say he's trying to describe the indescribable, but he's trying to help us see what he's seeing. He wants us to capture and to see a glimpse of God's beauty and his radiance and his majesty, but he can only do it by comparing God to valuable and precious stones that were known to him in his day. But first of all, then, we see God on his throne. The next phrase that we want to look at is found in verses 3 and 4, and that is the phrase, around the throne, around the throne. And we see in those verses that around the throne, there was a rainbow, and there were 24 thrones with 24 elders sitting on those thrones. We understand what a rainbow is, don't we? The, the rainbow even here in this, in this scene is like an emerald, which would radiate some kind of green colors. And even the, the mention of a rainbow here in this chapter is a great reminder for us, isn't it? That, that God's faithful and will be faithful to the covenant that he has made with his people. When he wiped out all humanity, remember in Genesis 6, 7, and 8 with the worldwide flood. And then at the end of the flood, God put his beautiful rainbow in the sky to remind us that he's never going to do that again. But isn't it interesting that here we see that there is a rainbow of sorts that existed in heaven probably long before there was ever a rainbow that could have been seen on earth after the flood. And so we see this rainbow in heaven, and, and it's kind of sad, isn't it, that even today that God's rainbow has been, you could say, stolen or perhaps hijacked by a community that is anti-God and anti-Christian. But we see this rainbow in heaven around the throne. But also around the throne, we see 24 other thrones with 24 elders on them, and we could spend quite a bit of time trying to think through and debate who these 24 elders are. Some believe that they are a, a higher order of angels. Others would prefer to see them as representing um, humans, um, representing the church. Personally, I tend to lean towards the idea that these 24 elders are representing the church, the local church, as we are today. Because it says there that these elders are sitting on thrones. 
And did you know the Bible says in Revelation 3, verse 21 it is, that Christians will one day reign with Christ. He's the ultimate ruler, but somehow we as Christians and church will reign with Christ. These elders are called elders, and I think that's a title more for humans than for angels. They are described as wearing white garments there. And then if you read earlier in the book of Revelation, white garments are promised to Christians or overcomers in the churches, in the church of Sardius and Laodicea. And also it says that these elders have golden crowns on their heads. And we know from Scripture that Christians will be given crowns or rewards depending on our service for God. So I think these are, the, this scene here of the 24 elders is referring to Christians. I mean, just try and for a moment picture all of this in your mind. Like I say, put yourself in John's shoes. Try to think that you were John having this vision. He's looking into heaven and he sees God in all his glory. And he sees this incredible array of brilliant colors, these greens, these reds, these, these bright colors that are kind of emanating out from the throne of God. And somehow all of these things are reflecting the glory of God and the person of God and the majesty of God. And then imagine, how would you write that down? How would you describe it? Well, this is how John is trying to help us see our great God who's seated on the throne in heaven. Well, one day we will get to see this God, our God, on the throne and all this beauty that John has seen in the past. So we've seen on the throne, God is on the throne, the one on the throne. We've seen around the throne. The third phrase I want us to notice is what we see coming from the throne. In verse 5, from the throne. It says, from the throne come flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And we all know what it's like, don't we, to experiencing to experience the intensity of lightning and the, the, the power of thunderclaps, which I don't know if we're going to have any today or if we've had any already, but we all understand what that's going to be like. I mean, if there was a massive storm just happening out there off the, off the ocean, it would be spectacular, wouldn't it, with lightning bolts and thunder rumbling through the skies. A raging storm is literally an awesome sight. Well, so too is this sight of thunder and lightning coming from the throne of God. And, and there are other times even in Scripture when thunder and lightning were present, and it usually is a sign that God is about to do something significant and something spectacular. If you go back to the Old Testament and in Exodus 19, just before God gave Moses the, the Ten Commandments, we read there in Exodus 19 that on the third day, when it was morning, there were thunder and lightning flashes and thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. I mean, back here in Revelation chapter 4, it's obvious, isn't it, that heaven is not a quiet place. It's loud, in a sense, when you see and hear these activities happening there. And in this context, God is about to reveal future events. From Revelation chapter 6 through the, the rest of the Revelation, God is about to unleash a lot of his power and a lot of his judgment upon sinful mankind. And so it's all introduced here by this lightning and by this thunder. And then later on in Revelation, in the seventh bold judgment, it says there that there will be flashes of lightning and peals of thunder, as well as a great earthquake, such as there has never been before. So sometimes when we think of lightning and thunder, we see the judgment of God being poured out upon certain individuals and upon the world. And when we see what comes out from the throne of God, we have to come to the conclusion, don't we, that our God is an awesome God. And I mean that in the real sense of the word. He's a powerful God. He's a majestic God. He's a glorious God. And so we see what's coming from the throne. The next thing we'll see in this passage is what is before the throne. In verses 5 and 6, it says there, before the throne... We're burning seven torches of fire. 
which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And so right before the throne, John sees these, these seven lamps of fire, or these seven torches, seven bright lights that are identified as the seven spirits of God. And you might be thinking to yourself, that sounds a little bit unusual. I haven't heard of that before. Is this like a, a threat? We believe in the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So what's this here, these seven spirits? Well, what we believe they're referring to, that they are a reference to the sevenfold representation of the Holy Spirit that is mentioned in Scripture. You can read about that in Isaiah chapter 11, where it says there that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, reverence, and deity. Seven qualities that describe the Holy Spirit. And so these seven torches are before the throne, but also before the throne it says something like a, a sea of glass-like crystal. And it's difficult to really know what this is. The Bible says in Revelation 21 verse 1 that there's no sea like the ocean. There's no sea in heaven. But whatever this is, it was shining brilliantly like sparkling crystal. I mean, in, a, in an attempt to try and summarize all of what's going on in this scene, one commentator says this, Heaven is obviously a world of dazzling, brilliant light. Refracting and shining as through jewels and crystal in a manner beyond our ability to describe or imagine. And I'm sure John was probably finding it hard to know what words to use. How do you describe these scenes that he would have been seeing? It's an incredible, it's an amazing, amazing vision. I mean, how often do you stop and just kind of ponder, what is God like? What is heaven going to be like well these kind of, these verses sort of help to answer that question for us but we'll never know fully until we get there it's a spectacular place it's a dazzling place it's a place of beauty we know that it's majestic it's it's magnificent it will be eye catching we we understand that and we understand too that it's going to be our future home and we're just getting a, just a, a a little glimpse of it here in this chapter so that's what we see before the throne, but then there's, there's something else that we see regarding the throne here, and that is on each side of the throne. On each side of the throne, at the end of verse 6 there, it talks about four living creatures, or some translations might say beasts, and I think maybe a little bit misleading those, those words, because these are not animals, they should perhaps be referred to as the living ones. They are situated very close to the throne, on the side of the throne. They're kind of in the inner circle on each side of the throne, it says there. And these living ones will play an important part in the, in the future events of tribulation. And so the question is, who are they? Who are these living ones? And I think the best conclusion is to view them as a, a special quartet of angels. Sometimes we might refer to these ones as the cherubim. Uh, you, if you read through Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, we won't look at it this morning, but if you read through those, help us to identify, and there is four of them, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, and they're closely associated with the throne, and they're, they're covered in eyes all around, it says, and these are, as we said, angels, a higher order of angels that are often seen throughout Scripture, and we see them right from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, and then we see them playing out in other parts of Scripture. Interesting, isn't it? It says they have eyes everywhere. Eyes in the front, eyes in the back. Kind of look a little bit unusual, but I think the, the idea here is that they can, they can see everything. They're, they are aware of what's going on. They're alert to what's happening. They've got a, some kind of knowledge of what's going on. And, and the very fact that they're located on the side of the throne, they're there. They're God's agents. They're ready. They're His servants who are ready to complete whatever task God might assign to them. And so we've seen the one on the throne, we've seen those that are around the throne, we've seen what's coming from the throne, what's before the throne, what's on each side of the throne. The next phrase really is, in many ways, probably most significant for us. And that is in the last few verses from the middle of verse 8 to the end of this chapter. And that is what I would just simply refer to as, as to him on the throne. Or you could say to him who is seated on the throne. 
And here we, we catch a glimpse in these verses of what it really means to worship God. Here we have what we might say is a sneak preview of what heaven is all about. If you want to learn about music, if you want to learn about songs, if you want to learn about worship, then this is a great place to begin. Revelation chapter 4 and even chapter 5. Because in these two chapters, we actually find five great hymns. There's a hymn that's been sung here in verse 8. It's been sung by the four living ones. And then we'll see in verse 10 and 11, there's like a second hymn, which is sung by the, the living ones, and they're joined by the 24 elders. And then if you were to read through chapter 5, it's like the, the choir in heaven, in a sense, gets bigger and bigger because there's another song that is sung in Revelation chapter 5 that is sung by the four living ones and the 24 elders and all the instruments accompany them. And then there's another song, a fourth hymn, where there's the four living creatures, the 24 elders. This time. And then there's a final fifth hymn in Revelation chapter 5 where there's the four living creatures, there's the 24 elders, there's the instruments, there's all the angels, and then there is all of creation that join in to worship and to praise Almighty God. In fact, let me read that verse there in Revelation 5.13. It says, John says in that verse, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and forever. I mean, these are some great lyrics to songs. These are God-centered songs, you could say. They're aimed at the one who sits on the throne. He is the center of our attention. He's the one on the throne. He should be the center of our worship. All worship is reserved for him and for him alone. There is nobody else worthy of such worship. And it's really some great principles here. Maybe you're a, a budding songwriter and you want to write some songs. Here's a great example of how you can write a song. Songs that are God-centered. And in, in the first song there in verse 8, it upholds the attributes of God. Look at what it starts off by saying, holy, holy, holy. We worship God by upholding His attributes. We uphold who He is. God's holiness is unique. It stands apart from everything else. We know that it's incomprehensible, don't we? To say that God is holy is to say that God is perfect. And so when we sing those words, we're acknowledging who He is and what He is like. And, and I think we would probably say that His holiness is almost like the supreme of all of His attributes. And oftentimes it's said that we don't go around singing eternal, 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 or wise, 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 or true, 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 but we go around singing holy, holy, holy. And Scripture often refers to God as the holy God. And we know that we worship the Holy Spirit as well. The heart of our worship ought to focus on the character of God, and especially His holiness as is demonstrated for us here in this passage. And so we need to examine God's attributes. And as we grow in our understanding of God's attributes, we will grow in our understanding of God. And in turn, that should energize us and it should increase our worship of Him. And we sing songs like that, don't we, thankfully? We sing the song, Holy, 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 or, or You Are Holy. And even some of the songs we sang this morning remind us of God's holiness. So we sing, holy, 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 and then we sing, is the Lord God Almighty? It's good to remind ourselves that God is all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He is almighty, not half-mighty or some mighty. He's almighty. He is not weak. He's strong. Nothing can hold him back. Nothing can stop his plans. He does whatever he chooses. He can make the blind to see, and he can heal the brokenhearted. And so we worship God and remind ourselves of his great attribute of omnipotence or power. He is the Lord God Almighty. And then notice what the verse says, as, the, as these living ones worshipped God, so too we worship God this way. Notice the end of that statement there, who was and who is and who is to come. In other words, God has no beginning. We worship the eternal God. He is eternal past and eternal future. 
He transcends all of time. And so recognizing and singing about these attributes of God brings him glory. It brings him honor. It brings him praise when we sing like this. Any song that we sing that elevates God's attributes is an awesome act of worship. In fact, I'm going to say, and I guess I would argue, that the more theology that's in the lyrics of a song, the greater the worship experience. It's not the tune, it's not the melody, it's not the rhythm, it's not, the, uh, it's not that aspect of a song that, that cultivates worship, it's the lyrics of the song that do. When our mind is engaged in the lyrics, that's what generates worship. Music style can often conjure up warm, fuzzy feelings, but we need to make sure we don't confuse that with what is true worship. And as we kind of look at this worship song in heaven here, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Notice that there's no reference to us. There's no reference really to humans you don't go finding any me's or my's or I's in these lyrics because the focus is all on the one who is seated on the throne. And I'm not sure who said this, but I think it's worth hearing. This person said, an emotional experience that is based on self and is devoid of theology is hardly an expression of worship. And I think they were trying to evaluate the, some, of the, some of the music that is going around Christian scenes at the moment. So this ongoing worship of God by the living creatures causes the the 24 elders in verse 10 to fall down before him and worship him who lives forever and ever. And notice what these 24 elders do. They cast their, their crowns before the throne. These 24 elders, they're not concerned about themselves or even their rewards. I mean, their crowns are in many ways insignificant compared to the majesty and the glory of of God himself, and all they want to do is worship. Nothing else matters. They kind of cast these down before God, and they worship the one who is seated on the throne. Maybe we just need to kind of stop and think about, are we, what is our attitude to worship? Are we really wanting to worship God like we see in the scene here in heaven? These These living ones, these 24 elders, all they wanted to do was worship. I mean, heaven is really, in many ways, a a place of endless worship. What do you think about worship in your own heart and in your own life? Are you looking forward to actually being in that experience and in that moment where we too can be in heaven worshiping God? A.W. Tozer made the comment, I can safely say on the authority of all that has been revealed in the word of God, that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. You know, if we find it hard to get out of bed on a Sunday or maybe any day of the week and we find it hard to come to God and worship, then we're going to probably find it hard to be in heaven because heaven is a place of worship. Notice what the 24 elders say in in verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why do they say that? Because you, God, created all things. The 24 elders, they worship God because God is the creator. He is the one who gave them life. He is the one who even gives us life. And he's the one who spoke this universe into into existence. He's the one who sustains this universe. He's the one who created the stars, the moon, the sky, the sun, the sea, the grass, the trees, everything that we can see out there, God created. Therefore, we need to worship him. It's good to remind ourselves, isn't it, that you and I were created to worship, to worship God. God created us to bring him glory. He wants us to worship him. God must be worshipped. And the question is, am I, am I truly worshipping God? Even this morning as we sat here, have I been worshipping God or has my mind been on other things? What am I thinking about? God is on his throne. He is the one on the throne. And everyone else around him is worshipping him. 
And likewise, our worship needs to be directed to him. There's a lot of worship happens in our world, but it doesn't necessarily all get directed to this one who is sitting on the throne. Are you a true worshiper this morning? Is your life focused on giving worship and praise and honor and glory to this one that we see sitting on the throne? Can you really say this morning, I worship you, almighty God, there is none like you. Because it is possible to say those words or even sing those words and it may not even be worship in your heart. Could you sing this morning, holy, holy, holy? As I said, some people might sing those words, but it's not authentic worship because they might even have unconfessed sin in their life. It's hard to worship God when we're living in sin. Singing songs in the context of church does not always mean that worship is happening. Could you sing the songs of that old kind of chorus we sung, used to sing a few years ago? God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. Is that your heart this morning to be able to do that? A.W. Tozer warns us again. He said, God calls us to worship. But in many circumstances or in many instances, we are in entertainment. Not or just running a poor second to the theaters, is what he said. He wrote it a few years ago. But are you a worshiper? God is sitting on his throne waiting for all of us to worship him. Therefore, we must worship him. I'm not sure who said this, but it's worth hearing for those of us who don't sing very well. This person said, I would rather worship God than do anything or any other thing I know of in all this wide world. I cannot sing a lick, but that is nobody's business. God thinks I'm an opera star. You know, singing is a normal act of worship for Christians. And I don't think God really cares if you sing in tune or not. God wants you to worship. I mean, I always like to say I'm a prison singer. You've heard me say that, right? I'm behind a few bars and I've lost the key. Um, some of us aren't wired to be great singers, but, you know, we are wired to be great worshipers. And there's nothing wrong with singing your heart out, even if you're not in tune. If your heart is to worship God, it's worship. So God is on his throne. He reigns. God reigns. Nobody else is reigning in this world, only he is. He is the ultimate reigner. We know that there are others who are trying to have certain authority in different ways, but ultimately God's in charge. He reigns, ultimately. He is in control. He is the one who's sitting on the throne, and we need to worship him. And so John's given us just a little glimpse of his vision here and helped us try and understand it and I trust and I pray that as we've just looked at these verses briefly this morning, that it'll just help us to maybe realign our lives. I think we would probably all say, yeah, I'm a worshiper. I know I want to worship God. That's why I'm here for what he's telling me all this for. I'm here to worship. But you know what? Sometimes we just need to refine our lives and take stock. Am I really worshiping God as I really ought to? Am I truly giving him the praise and the glory and the way that I live? Worship's not just singing. We understand that. Worship is a lifestyle of honoring God in everything that we do. Everything. Our work life, our, work, our study life, our home life, our parenting life. Whatever you're involved in during the week, it's an act of worship or can be an act of worship if you do it with the right heart and with the right motivation. So maybe you just need to put the handbrake on in your own life and evaluate how you're doing in that area of your life. Are you worshiping God in every area of your life? Not just on a Sunday morning, but Monday to Saturday as well. Well, let's bow our heads. I'm going to pray, and I think the guys are going to come and finish us uh, up with a song. Father, it is a joy just to be able to reflect on these words and even to be able to catch a glimpse, as it were, of who you are and what you're like. And we see that heaven is a magnificent place and... Lord, we fully don't comprehend it, we don't understand all of it, but we, we certainly look forward to that day where we will be with you and we will be able to see, even with our own eyes, the, the glorious nature and the majestic nature of heaven and, 
and even your character and your glory. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to um, remember these truths, that they would motivate us to be able to honor you and to live for you until that day that we, we're called to be worshiping in the throne room of heaven, as it were. But Lord, until that day, help us to worship you in this life and everything that we do. Lord, we want to give you praise and worship. Help us do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.